When I was a kid, sometimes I got in trouble for doing stupid stuff. One particular example stands out in my mind. When I was about eight years old, we lived on an acreage, and my cousin came over, we were about the same age, and we were playing out in the windbreak, and we found a, a large nest of about 10 turkey eggs. I don't know if you've ever held an actual turkey egg in your hand, but it has some real heft to it. It's not small, and if you're an eight-year-old boy, that egg just sits in your hand like, a, like an oblong, perfectly formed missile, just, just begging you to launch it against some target. So, so we gathered up these turkey eggs and we went around to the backside of the barn and what do you do? What else could we possibly have done? I, just in case anyone is here this morning from PETA, I don't want you to be alarmed because these eggs were not fresh. If they ever had had something living in them, that time had long since passed. No, these eggs were incredibly ripe, which was part of the, the explosive glory of these eggs. Our main, our main tactical mistake was choosing a launch site upwind from the house. And this, this mistake dawned on us too late as we watched this sulfurous cloud drift slowly from the barn toward the house. But if you're, if you're an eight-year-old boy and you find a turkey egg in the woods, what do you assume? You assume that at some point in time in the not too recent past, at some place not too far away, there was a turkey. C.S. Lewis says this about an atheist. He said, an atheist or, or a person who believes strictly in a, in a natural material universe, that that's all there is. He says, an atheist is a person who sees an egg but does not believe in chickens, or in this case, turkeys. The universe is just here, its existence is a fact, but somehow the atheist has faith that it arrived here miraculously somehow on its own out of nowhere. We are continuing our, our journey through Acts chapter 17. Last week, we noted that Paul is in Athens. Athens is the the glittering nerve center of the Western world. Paul is taken to the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill, and he is asked to give a defense for Christianity before the Mars Hill Council. And we noted last week how it was really probably more of a trial for his life than it was a sermon. I trust that I'm standing up here this morning giving more of a sermon than a trial for my life. But, but Paul stands up here and, and his, his speech, which we're about to hear the, the full speech this morning, it has really almost endless depths. If this speech seems daunting at times, and it is, Remember that Paul was speaking to the world's leading philosophers, and we get to listen in on that conversation. Paul is going to, in this speech, he's going to, to deconstruct the prevailing worldview of, of the men of Athens. He's going to deconstruct it with a, with a velvet sledgehammer with his words, and but he's not just going to tear that down. He's going to, to rebuild for them a true model of, of who God is, what the universe is, what human beings are. He's going to tear down and then he's going to build up. And this really is a, a cosmically life and death contest between the worldview of the Athenians and, and the, the biblical worldview. And Paul's speech at, at the Areopagus is a master class in confronting the belief system of the ancient world of Athens, 
maybe more surprising, it's also a master class in confronting false belief systems of our own age, of, of our modern age. Paul begins by complimenting his audience, by, by connecting to them. What does Paul use as a bridge to connect to them? This struck me as really interesting. He uses one of their own idols to build a bridge to them. Paul, Paul builds a bridge and he, he tries to walk them over this great divide toward God. He says this in verse 22. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. They would have received that as a compliment. He says, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. This is remarkable. Last week we we read that Paul, as he first arrived in Athens, he was waiting for his friends, just walking around the streets of Athens, and he saw this, literally this forest of idols in Athens, and it, it made him sick. But he, he keeps his composure, and he actually uses one of their idols as a, as a bridge to connect with them. Paul was standing in this spot in the Areopagus, and, and virtually every building that you can see up there is a temple to one of the Athenian gods. How does Paul introduce God in the next verse? He introduces God as creator, creator of everything, Lord of everything, everything. Verse 24 says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. God as creator. This will always be a most essential attribute of God, that of creator. As creator, God is the source of all reality. Everything that is not God comes from God. The Christian doctrine of creation makes a particular claim, claims that God created all of reality ex nihilo. It's a, it's a fancy word. Ex means out of, nihilo means nothing. So, so God created everything out of nothing. I, it's hard to overstate the importance of this truth that positively nothing exists outside of God. God spoke creation into being out of nothing, ex nihilo. Why is that such a big deal? Why is that so crucial? For everything that exists, everything, its being, its existence is sourced in God. Its existence comes from God, verse 24. So if God made all of reality, then he is Lord over all reality. And, and perhaps this is the part of the biblical story that most jarringly collides with the, the modern secular story that the world tells about itself. The modern secular story says that the universe exists on its own, independently from God. It, it had its origin apart from God, and it continues to run along more or less on its own. The Bible makes a radically different claim that the universe is created, not just that it was created sometime in the past, but that it, it continues to be sustained moment by moment by a loving God who inhabits his universe Every moment that we exist, every moment depends on God just as much as the very first moment of creation. I want to introduce another big word. It's an important word. It's the word cosmology. It just means origins. Where do things come from? Now, the Bible has 
cosmology account. What is it? It's, it's Genesis 1 and 2, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Does the modern secular world have a cosmology story? It does. Every society that has ever existed has had a cosmology story, an origin story. What is the modern secular world's cosmology story? It's the Big Bang story at this point. The Big Bang theory supposes that some 14 to 15 million years, sorry, billion years ago, that there was an enormous amount of energy and matter concentrated in a very small, unbelievably dense space that, that erupted into uh, the birth of the universe, something we call the Big Bang. But the Big Bang theory has at its root a, a massive unsolvable problem, a problem that's actually transparent to an eight-year-old, which is, <laughs> Where in the world did that enormous amount of concentrated energy and matter come from? In fact, why is there something instead of nothing? The only answer that, that Big Bang cosmologists can, can supply is that either that concentration of, of matter, matter and energy existed forever, or that somehow it created itself. If an eight-year-old finds a turkey egg, he assumes <laughs> the existence of something outside of that egg, right? If I asked all of you for the next two seconds, everyone close their eyes, and, and we look up here on the stage, and there's, there's nothing over here in the section of the stage, and two seconds later, when you opened your eyes, you saw a large egg sitting on the stage, you would assume <laughs> something was responsible for putting that there, right? An eight-year-old knows <laughs> that a, a physical thing cannot come from nothing. An egg cannot magically appear out of nowhere. If there is a physical universe, which there is, then it must have come from something that is not itself. I know this, this bends the mind, but bear with me, this is really important. Here's another illustration that maybe will help us. Big Bang proponents like to think of the universe as a, a domino chain, a, a very, very long domino chain that stretches back a long, long way into the past. But the, the first domino is, is the Big Bang, the, the first big explosive domino. But the problem is it doesn't matter how far you go back up the domino chain or how long the domino chain is, eventually you have to come to a first domino. But where did that domino come from? And who tipped it over? And what got it going? Technically speaking, this is not a question that science can answer. It's not because of any defect in science. If I say that my dog cannot speak French, I'm not offering a critique of my dog. It's just outside of the scope of his ability, right? Science is a, is a perfectly good thing. It's a, it's a noble enterprise but it simply is not able to explain origins of existence. Science can only deal with physical processes, domino chains that already exist, but science cannot explain how the first domino got here or who tipped it over or why there are dominoes in the first place instead of nothingness. So, so logic dictates that we must acknowledge that something exists beyond science. Our society may be the first society, modern Western societies, may be the first societies to believe the myth that something can come from nothing. It is indefensible 
on science's own terms because according to the laws of science, physical things cannot make themselves out of nothing. I know this makes our brains hurt <laughs> hanging in here. This is the modern myth of, of, of the modern cosmology story, the modern origin story. It is a myth that our universe came from nothing because it has to be a myth. If, if it's true, it has to be a miracle. It has to be a violation of scientific law. To be a strict materialist, you have to believe that a massive miracle started it all. Paul is going to return throughout this whole speech to themes of creation. Let's move on to verse 24. In verse 24, Paul says, God does not live in temples made by man. Now, give credit to Paul. The dude's got guts and, and moxie. <laughs> he's, he's standing surrounded by all of these temples made by man to serve the Greek gods. Paul says, the true God does not need you to build a roof over his head. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. A real God doesn't need you to make him a sandwich. Right? Isaiah in the Old Testament has this wonderful and, and biting description of idols and the people who carry them around. Isaiah says this in Isaiah chapter 46. He's talking about people who, who carry around these heavy idols. He says, their idols are born or carried by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They, the idols and the, those who carry them, they stoop and bow down together. Unable to rescue the burden, they themselves go off into captivity. Listen to me, people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth, carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs. I am he, I am he who, sustain, who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Idols always promise to serve us and we always end up serving them under a very heavy yoke. When, when we lived in Asia, we lived in a small town and our town had all these little shops. Um, you, could, you could go to the, to the market section and it had a little shop for everything and we had a, a student who was in our English school. Her name was Melody. And she told us a really interesting story one day. She worked in one of these shops after, after school. And one day she went to the shop where she worked every day. And the shopkeeper was a middle-aged guy. And he had a, a son, a elementary-aged son. And the shopkeeper was, was mercilessly beating his son. And, and she said, what in the world did he do to deserve this beating? And the shopkeeper, who was also the dad, he said, well, oh, so I have to back up a second. So, so in many of these shops, you'd walk in and there would be up on the, on the shelf or on a wall in a prominently displayed place, there would be a, a God shelf or an idol shelf. And it would usually have some candles or some incense sticks and usually a small assortment of, of of gods or idols. And this was really typical. It was uh, meant to, to bring good luck or prosperity to the shop. And so, so she said, what, what did he do to, to, to get this beating? And, and the, the dad said, well, I just realized that a while ago, probably a month ago, my son took a chair over there under, under the idol shelf, put it up against the wall, climbed up on the chair and reached up there and, and took a couple of the idols and, and put them in the back of the shop under, under a cloth. And in its place, he had this, uh, this little 
plastic toy figurine, like a superhero figurine, and apparently its name was Ultraman, was the popular figurine at that time. So he took his Ultraman figurine and he, he climbed up there and he put Ultraman up there in the place of where the gods had previously been. And so the, the, the dad, the shopkeeper said, you know, I, I rely on these gods to make this shop go well. And for a month, uh, the, the gods have been back under, uh, under in storage and Ultraman has been in charge of taking care of this shop. Paul says in verse 25, your gods, your false gods need stuff from you, but the true God gives all since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Why does God need nothing from us? Because God himself is the source of all life and everything else. He is gloriously self-sufficient, overflowing with life and blessing and goodness and light. God did not create the universe or us because he was lonely. For all eternity, God existed in perfection of the Trinity, perfect joy and bliss and love and unity. God created us in our world out of the overflow of his his goodness and his love and his joy. Paul now begins to describe this relationship between God and us. God, the creator, the uncreated, all sufficient, overflowing in us. What does Paul say about humanity? Again, Paul returns to this idea of creation. In verse 26, he says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. It's a challenging couple of sentences. Every nation of mankind, Paul says, is made from one man. The men of Athens, to whom Paul was speaking, they thought of themselves as a superior race. Now, I've visited quite a few countries in the world. I think pretty much everybody thinks of themselves (laughs) as the superior race. It's just a human thing to do. The Greek word here for every nation is every ethnos, from which we get the English word ethnic. So Paul says every Every ethnic group, every race, every nation uh, is made from one man. Paul knocks the legs out of any kind of racial superiority here. And this is where our cosmology stories, our, our origin stories rush back in and they really matter because Darwin's theory got in big trouble when it, it claimed that, that since human beings evolved, and we evolved more or less randomly. There's no mind directing it, so it's a a random process. Likely, humans evolved differently. That would make sense, right? Hence, some races would be more evolved than others. It has a certain logic within the Darwinian system. Darwin's theory in the early 1900s, especially 1920s, 1930s, got all tangled up with progressive policies of eugenics. The Nazis loved Darwin. Margaret Sanger, the racist founder of Planned Parenthood, loved Darwin. Darwin gave them quasi-scientific justification for their ideas and their policies of weeding out inferior races. Paul is having none of it. Paul states plainly, every nation, every ethnic group came from the same source. For better or for worse, (laughs) red, brown, yellow, black, or white, we're all in the same boat. The same glory of being made in God's image and all caught up in the same tragedy of the fall. Oddly, today, some progressives are now 
claiming a new type of racial essentialism, that, that race or ethnicity is, is the most important thing about us, that, that it's an unbridgeable gap between people. Nonsense. People are people. Yes, race is a factor in, in some groups of people oppressing others, but Scripture gives no warrant for that kind of thing. Quite the opposite in this passage. Paul also certainly had in mind this doctrine that we are all in Adam. We're all pulled down in Adam's fall, all united in the misery of sin. But in Christ, God reorders the world, reunites us in one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. This is another reference back to Genesis where God commissioned human beings to spread out over the entire earth as God's image bearers, those who reflect God's good reign to creation. Verse 26 continues, having determined allotted periods, this likely refers to God's sovereignty over over the ages of human history. And God, it says, he determined the boundaries of their dwelling place. Again, a call back to Genesis 1, where God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The human race today is fractured. Think the Tower of Babel, fractured by our idols, fractured by our our selfish pursuit of ambition and pleasure, which fractures families. Children always bear the brunt of these things. Our heavy idols crush us, they fracture us into conflict between nations, between races, between individuals. This section of Paul's message demolishes the basis for all of that Paul says, we were made from one man, from Adam. We're all implicated in Adam's fall. There's no room for any any one person or any one race feeling superior. But in Christ, God reorders the world, made from one man, Adam, reunited in one man, Jesus Christ. And why, why were we created? What are we made for? Verse 27, and this I think is the heart of Paul's address. He says, we were made to seek God. Verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. You and I were created by God created for relationship with him, for joy and fellowship and union with him. We're like an intricately designed key that that fits only one lock. We're made to be with God. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, Augustine said. Yet somehow in in this verse, there's also a sense that something is wrong. Isn't there something is out of joint? It's disconnected. Paul's language of seeking and feeling, in in the original language, that suggests an image of of groping in the dark, of the grasping, fumbling fingers of an elderly blind man. We feel that, don't we? Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, and and you wonder, are we all alone? (laughs) Maybe our planet is just a big rock detached and floating through a cold, dark, meaningless, senseless universe, hurtling through empty space, destined to burn out. On this rock, each of us have to to scramble to invent ourselves out of thin air. We all feel the chill of of, of the fear that 
Maybe we are living in an empty universe, that we're all alone, that this is all there is, that the materialist story of the universe is the true story. And yet, Paul says in verse 27, yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. That, that sentence, you could spend the rest of your life, I hope you will spend the rest of your life meditating on that sentence. What does it mean that in him we live and move and have our being? One of the celebrity atheists who came to fame over the last 30 years was a, a, a British man named Stephen Hawking. He is a director, or he was the director at Cambridge University of the Center for Theoretical Cosmology. There's that word again, the, the origins of everything. A few years ago, a movie was made about his life. It was called The Theory of Everything. It's a funny phrase. Originally, that phrase was, was kind of a joke within the scientific community of, of scientists poking fun at themselves, at the arrogance of thinking that we could actually figure out everything about the universe. But, but that's what Hawking actually came to believe that wouldn't happen in his lifetime, but he, he came to believe that eventually human beings would would solve the riddle of, of everything, have a, an understanding of every last atom in the universe. And how, how could he even <laughs> think that? He's obviously a very intelligent guy. How could he think that the human beings could eventually discover everything about the universe? Because, in, in Hawking's view, the physical universe, the material universe, is all there is. It's only physical, what we can see and touch and measure. It's all essentially a big machine. So, like any machine, if you work long enough at it, you can take it apart. You can, you can look at all of its individual parts. You can catalog all of its individual parts, identify them and figure out them and, and, and master them. This is how he thought of the universe, as a, as a machine. Actually, a, a perpetual motion machine. Uh, do you know what a perpetual motion machine is? Since at least Leonardo da Vinci, scientists have been, inventors have been chasing the unicorn of trying to come up with a perpetual motion machine. This was a issue of Popular Science magazine from, I, actually I can't see the date on that, but the whole, the whole issue was, devoted to the idea of a perpetual motion machine. But eventually science proved that, I think we have some physics teachers in here this morning, right? That, that perpetual motion machines are impossible because though a machine may run on for a long, long time, eventually its energy will, will dissipate, will, will leak away, so to speak. So if, if the modern story of of origins of our universe is that it's, it's like a machine. It, it began with the Big Bang, that what we can see and touch and measure is all there is, all there ever was. It's a closed system. It's self-contained. It, it seems to work. It doesn't seem to need anything. And if I, if I imagine the world as a machine and I can, I can describe its processes, then then that doesn't really need God, that explanation. If I can explain it in terms of its mechanical processes, then I can, I can say that God really isn't necessary. Now this, this machine-like view of the world is actually far more influential than we realize actually on, on us as, as modern Western Christians. In fact, a great many Christians share a view of the universe that's actually more machine-like, uh, actually has more in common with our secular neighbors than, than we might imagine. How, how can I make that claim? Modern Christians may not believe that the Big Bang got everything going. We, we may believe that God got everything going, 
with the miracle of creation a long, long time ago. But now, we tend to think, this world kind of just runs along on its own, like a machine. God may show up every once in a while. He may, he may break in and, and break the laws of the universe, the laws of physics, every once in a while by a miracle. What if that's wrong? <laughs> what, if, what if the universe itself, the whole thing, <laughs> all of existence, all of reality, is actually a miracle? That, that what we live in is a living world, a personal world, a relational world inhabited by the one who created it. God made our universe to speak. The heavens declare the glory of God. Really, they, everything that we see is created to speak to us, to be transparent to us of God and his love for us. I, I heard a story a little while back that during the French Revolution, this was 1789, uh, the French Revolution was, was, a, was a revolt of, of secular people uh, wanting to tear down the authority of, well, all, all, of, all of the political structures, but they also were very intent on tearing down the authority of the church and, and installing in its place the goddess of reason. They actually put a, a statue to the goddess of reason in the Notre Dame Cathedral. And uh, there, was, there was one group of, of of, uh, of the rioters, the, 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 the French Revolution Jacobins, who, who were going through the city tearing down churches. And they came upon this, this group of, of French peasants whose church they tore down, and they said, uh, hey, you suckers, we, we just tore down your church. You're not going to be able to worship God or hear from God anymore because we just tore down your church. And one of the peasants stood up and said, you may tear down our churches, you may tear down our cathedrals, but you cannot tear down the stars. <laughs> the heavens declare the glory of God. They speak of his, his presence and his love to us. Verse 27, Paul says, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. How close is he? For in him we live and move and have our being. What does that mean? In him we have our being. Augustine says, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. He's more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. You are more loved than you can possibly love. You are more known than you can possibly know. We are meant to seek God like a child seeks its mother, for we are indeed his offspring, Paul says. These are extraordinary lines. You could spend the rest of your life <laughs> chewing on them. And this is a radically different picture of reality than that offered by the modern secular materialist story of reality, of the world simply as a, as a mindless machine. And that metaphor of a senseless machine, it's so dehumanizing. And, and it's not true. Paul replaces it with a far more, far more beautiful image, a, a true image, that we are not a machine, but we are God's offspring. Think of, instead of thinking of a machine, think of of an unborn baby in the womb. God is the one who contains us. We are the ones kept, sustained, held. The unborn baby depends moment by moment on the miracle of the mother's womb. The unborn baby has no life apart from the mother's womb. If you remove the mother and, and the baby's life instantly comes to an end. In God, we live and move 
and have our being. Each moment of your existence is miraculous, just as much as the moment you were conceived, just as much as the moment the universe was created. Each moment hangs like a silver thread from God. If God lost attention for a moment, all of us and then the universe itself would, would cease to exist. God will not lose attention. His gaze of love is always on us. If this sounds almost like too much, <laughs> there's, there's other passages in the New Testament that, that speak to this same idea. Hebrews 1 says that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1 says, in him all things hold together. And this passage in Acts 17, we are his offspring and in him we live and move and have our being. Every moment is miraculous. Every atom is sustained by God. Reality has no existence apart from God. We do not live in a meaningless universe, an empty, lonely universe. Someone said, God is always present to us. We are the ones who are often absent, but he is always present. We are sourced in God and from him we receive our very being. Verse 29 now says, since we come from God, we must not think that, that real gods can come from us. He says, God's made of, of gold or silver or stone, formed by the art and imagination of man. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now, Paul says, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Verse 31 says, judgment day is coming because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. God so loved the world, and because he loves the world, and the world that he loves and made has been wrecked by sin, God will not stand idly by and watch it burn. One day he will step in and execute judgment and accountability, and those who, who have rebelled against God and assaulted his good order and his good world and ruined the lives of so many people, the people that God loves, those who have aligned themselves against God will be judged in righteousness. Judgment is coming. The great question for us is will we, will we come over to God's side? Will we find shelter under the cross? Or will we be caught out in the open on our own on the day that this world is judged. Judged, verse 31 says, by a man whom he has appointed, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the one man who can actually judge the world without being a hypocrite, because the one man who never sinned, who always told the truth, nothing, nothing, is more crucial for you and for I than whether we are with Christ or against him. To be with Christ is to be aligned to all of reality, to be out of joint with him, disconnected from him, is to be out of joint with all of reality because he is the source, the author, and the final judge of all reality. Sometimes I think we think of evangelism as, as trying to convince people of, of something, a lifestyle option or a preference that maybe we vaguely believe in ourselves. We have to pep talk ourselves in order to get a, 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 a change of heart or mind in the, in, the, in the private life of another person. Evangelism... <laughs> is actually the communication 
of the most crucial essence of all reality because Jesus is the logos at the center of all reality. He is the creator, he's judge. What proof do we have that Jesus is the author and the source and the center of all reality? Paul tells us that. He says that when, when the world killed Jesus, when Jesus offered himself up, that God raised him from the dead, verse 31. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. If the resurrection did not happen, Paul says this elsewhere, Christianity is, is just a cruel joke. If it did happen, Jesus deserves my worship, my allegiance, my entire life. The resurrection validates Jesus not to himself, Jesus already knew who he was, not to God the Father. It does validate Jesus to us, to humans. Paul's speech here in, in Acts 17, it, it started out seeker-friendly, and Paul was genuinely trying to make a connection to his audience, but it ends with some really hard words. You notice Paul didn't put these in until the end of the speech because as soon as he starts talking about these things, uh, they, they shuffle him off the stage. It ends with, with hard words, words that, that do not go down easily. They're loving words, but they won't go down at all if, if we don't surrender my life to my creator, my righteous judge. You notice at the end of the speech when Paul mentions Jesus and the resurrection, it provokes mockery, verse 32. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others say, we will hear you again about this. Some, not many, some joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others. This isn't a long list. One of the men, apparently, who was on the Mars Hill Council, a woman named Damaris, a few others. Paul gives one of the, one of the most masterful gospel presentations of all time, <laughs> and the response is actually fairly small. But these seeds that were planted in the lives of, of Dionysius and Damaris, wouldn't you love to hear the rest of the story? <laughs> I would wager in eternity we'll, we'll get to hear the rest of that story, that, that the seeds planted in their lives became the seeds of the church in Athens and beyond. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, our... our our minds struggle to, <laughs> to get uh, around your infinity. Our, our finite minds actually cannot wrap ourselves around your infinite uh, power and, and glory and, and goodness. And I pray, though, that you would, you would deepen our, our, our understanding, our sense of, of who you are and how totally we depend for our very existence on you. And I, I pray that that would reshape even the way that we look at, at, at creation, at, at nature, at the people around us as we go out this week. Help us to, to expect to hear from you, to encounter you everywhere we go because you are uh, at the center of all reality. Help us to surrender our hearts to your, to your good authority. Help us, Father. We need, we need you to draw us to yourself and show us yourself. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen.